If you want to flip with me in your Bible, if you got it on you, if you want to have your Bible in your, on your phone, flip with me, we'll be to Matthew chapter 7, which is uh, one of the, we'll be in Matthew 5, we'll be in Matthew 7, and we'll be in Matthew chapter 10 for a little bit uh, as well. So Matthew chapter 7 today, but I want to tell you, this is not going to be your typical Mother's Day sermon. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but I, my prayer, I've been reading this text for a long time. A long time. And, and I've read it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Just to make sure, just to, I love reading Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. There's something, you know, the, every word in the Bible is equally inspired and revealed by God. But there is something different about the words in red. Even, even though all of it's inspired, when you read Jesus' words, something powerful about them. And, uh, and, and, and that's where we're going to be today in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And, and my prayer is that it will convict but it will also encourage those who are already on the narrow path and on the narrow, through the narrow gate. And it will encourage those moms who have led their kids through the narrow gate. Amen? I'm so thankful for godly mothers who lead their kids to know Jesus. I entitled this sermon 50-50. And it's not going to be your typical Mother's Day sermon, but I believe it's something that has been on my heart for a while and this was the week to do it. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, it covers chapters 5 through 7 in the book of Matthew. And Jesus is speaking to a great crowd of people. And the Sermon on the Mount is entitled the Sermon on the Mount because that's the location where he was. But his Sermon on the Mount covers, he's like one of those pastors. You know those pastors who, who bounce around from topic to topic? They don't preach one message, they preach 17. Come on, you know some pastors like that. I try not to be that way, but maybe I should be. Jesus is kind of like that in the Sermon on the Mount. I, don't know, I wonder how long this sermon was. But Jesus is, is preaching and he, he's teaching the people, he's teaching the crowds, and he teaches them on a variety of topics. But his main point in his whole entire message is he's re speaking out to false religion. He's speaking out to false religion. And the false religion of his day that he was speaking out to in this moment was Judaism. He's speaking out against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and these Jewish tradition and this law-based religion. He's speaking out against it. Look what he says in Matthew chapter 5. Throughout the whole sermon, he's speaking out against it. And he speaks out very clearly against it. Matthew 5, though, look what he says in 27 through 30. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. The Bible says that in the Old Testament. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. That's a scary message, but a powerful one. He uses some vivid imagery in his message. But his point is he's speaking out against this exterior, law-based religion where it says, well... Committing adultery is just exterior. It's just what you do. It's just a sin itself. And Jesus, radically in the Sermon on the Mount, goes against that type of religion. Amen? What does He say? He says, it's about where your heart is. It's about the interior. Where is your heart? And that's what good godly mothers do. They lead their children to devote their hearts to Jesus Christ. Not just behavior modification, but devoting their whole heart and letting Jesus radically change them. Amen? You see, the true religion that Jesus wants to teach us is that it takes a change of heart. It takes laying down everything in your life. And when you change, when God changes your heart, then your actions will change. I know you've heard this many times. The religion of the day, Judaism, is exterior, all about outward appearance, all about let me do the right thing so that other people will see how good I am. He speaks out against the Pharisees. These people pray out in public. 
so that everybody can see them. Jesus says pray in private where nobody sees you, amen? Pray in your house. These people beat their heads on the wall when they pray. He says don't do that. Pray in private. It's about the condition of your heart. What do you do when nobody else is watching? Are you in your word when nobody's watching? Or are you in your word just around people? God is speaking out, or Jesus is speaking out, and He's combating a message of false religion. And this is still the message we are combating today. We are in an all-out war against this same exact message. False religion has been the same from the start, and it will be the same in the end. It's always been the same. You can do it on your own. You can be good. And it's not true. Jesus ends his Sermon on the Mount in, in probably the scariest four illustrations in probably all the Bible to me. He ends it with some scary illustrations, and I want to call them 50-50 illustrations, because all of them are sets of two, they're choices. He ends with four different 50-50 choices in Matthew chapter 7. He ends with the choice of two gates. Or two roads. He ends with the choice of uh, there's some false prophets and there's some true prophets. He ends with there's some false disciples and there's some true disciples. And then he ends finally with the last illustration is build your house on a solid foundation and then there's sinking sand foundation. Amen? And and he, he ends with these four illustrations and they are scary. And I don't preach this to scare you. I preach this to tell you the truth. (laughs) And that's why Jesus preached it. Preach it so that someone will come to know Him personally. Amen? And I pray that it encourages those that are are godly mothers and godly people in this place. It encourages you to say, I'm on the narrow gate. I'm on the narrow path. Look at at Matthew 7, 13 through 14. And we're going to spend all our time focusing on these two verses. And we're going to share some rough scriptures today. This chapter is one of the scariest chapters in all the Bible. Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Listen, listen to what he says. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Those who find it are few. Those are quite possibly the scariest two verses in all of the Bible. Why? Look at what it says. One road is narrow. It's small. Uh, the picture, I kind of tra- tried to depict that in that picture. One road is wide. I picture this road as the six-lane highway when you get in Atlanta. Anybody ever been there? Six-lane highway. And the thing is, if you go through there in rush hour, you see there's a big crowd <laughs> on that six-lane highway. If you watch The Walking Dead, they're heading to destruction. You may not, but... One road, I picture the broad road as the, as the road, the six-lane highway, and entering into Atlanta and going through Atlanta, and I picture the narrow road as this road that's in between two mountains. It's this narrow, rocky path that goes uphill, and it's not easy. Look what he says. One road is narrow. One gate is narrow. One gate is broad, or one road is broad, it's huge, it's wide. One road has many people heading down it, one road has few. One road is easy, and one road is hard. Now this does not go against the scripture where Jesus says, my yoke is easy. It doesn't go against that at all. This is talking about something a little bit different. The road to Christ and the narrow road, the narrow gate is hard. The wide road is easy. And I just want to go through this scripture and really explain it and really let us get what Jesus is trying to point at. Remember, the whole context of the situation is very important. He is combating false religion. False religion. The religion of the exterior says, I can do these things. Look at, look at these. First one, two gates. There are two gates that are pictured and the main point that Jesus wants you to get across and the main point that I want to get you get across to you today is this. 
Both gates are acting as if they are the one true gate. That is why this scripture is scary. Because the false gate that is leading all these people to destruction, as Jesus says, does it look false? No. Unless you know the Word of God. Are they saying, hey, we're a false gate? No. They're not. They're trying, this false gate is trying to disguise itself as the gate that leads to eternal life. This gate, both gates try to look right. Both gates try to look good. Both gates try to, try to look as if they're going to eternal life. But only one of them does. I told you this wasn't your typical Mother's Day sermon. <laughs> Both gates are trying to look as if they're leading to eternal life, but only one does. Look at this. False religion doesn't come out and say, hey, I am a lie. <laughs> doesn't do it. It's subtle. That's what's scary about Satan sometimes. We speak of Satan as like he comes out and he's blatantly obvious as who he is. It's not what the Bible says about him. The Bible says Satan disguises himself as what? An angel of light. He tries to act as if what he's doing is Christian, is right. Very scary. And the two gates, but they don't come out and blatantly say it. You see, Jesus is basically saying right here, there are only two types of religions in the world. You know that? There's only two types of religions. There's not a bunch of different religions in the world. There are two types. The true one and the false ones. There are two types. True and false. And all these other false ones, they give you the same message. They may word it a little different, but it's the same. You can get to heaven on your own by being a good person. All of them. Buddhism. Hinduism. Islam. All these other religions, it's all about you. You can do it. You can get there. And it looks great to us as human beings. It's all about human accomplishment. And it's all false. There are two types of religions in the world. True and false. And there's only one that is true. And it's Jesus Christ. It's Christianity. It's the truth. This is a broad road. This false religion is a broad road. You see how it's broad. You can see it just in what I just said. You have all these other religions trying to act as if they're the true gate, they're the true way to eternal life. And they're all over here in this broad category. And you can see why the, nate, why the gate is narrow. And we'll get to that in just a minute. There's two gates. There's only two types of religions Jesus is saying. There's true and there's false. We may categorize it however we want to in the world today. But the way we as Christians need to think about it is there are a bunch of people following false religion. False. Christianity is exclusive. Amen? It's exclusive. People say that we're... What's the word people say about us as Christians? I, I can't think of it off the top of my head. You're, you're a bigot. You think you're the only way. No, I don't think that. Jesus told me that. I don't think that I'm the only way. I don't, think that Jesus, I, don't, I don't think that Jesus is the only way. I know it because Jesus said it. And the truth of the matter is that that's why we come on Mother's Day and we celebrate godly mothers at church because they're leading their kids towards the narrow path. Amen? They're leading. I texted my mom this morning and said, I thank you so much for leading me towards the narrow path. Because there are a bunch of people heading to destruction down this false road. Whether whatever road they think they're on, it's false. And it's leading to destruction. And Jesus is the only way that leads to life. It's true and false religion. There's two gates. And they both try to look as if they're good. That's what's scary about it to me. Look at number two, the narrow gate. And I said this earlier. I picture this gate as a gate that's in between two mountains. And this path is this winding path that leads up the mountain. 
And only one person can fit through it at a time. No more than one person can fit on the path. You have to walk straight behind each other because only one person can get through at a time. This narrow gate is narrow. We may think, why doesn't God create a wide, broad gate so that more people can come to know Him? The gate is narrow for one reason. Because there's one way. And I already jumped ahead in my sermon a little bit. There's one way. The gate is narrow. I, I, I almost brought like a, a little gate for a mouse up here and then like a big giant gate up here. There's one gate. One way. The gate is narrow for one reason, because Jesus is the only way to eternal life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. And nobody gets to the Father except through me. Amen. Nobody. And if people want to call us bigots for that, they can do that. It's fine. John MacArthur says, people like to say I'm exclusive. He says, I'm more exclusive than you think. There's one way. Jesus Christ. All these other religions, self-righteousness, Hinduism, Buddhism, legalism, Judaism, all these other roads that are saying they lead to eternal life are leading to destruction because there is only one way. And if you don't believe in Jesus, you are on a path to destruction. And I can't put it any other way. Jesus said it. I didn't, I'm not saying anything He did not say. So, the narrow gate is narrow because there's one way. The narrow gate is narrow, part B, because narrow gate is hard. This path to Christianity, we like to have people come up front and give their life to Jesus in a moment. Maybe that's not how it should even be done. Because it's easy to come up here for one second and say, I'm a Christian. It's hard to walk the path with Christ for a lifetime. It is hard to walk the path with Christ when you have to give up things in your life and people in your life. This gate is hard. Look what he says. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, but those who enter in it by many. For the gate is narrow. And look what he says in verse 14. And the way is hard that leads to life. Man, a lot of people don't want to come through the narrow gate. You know why? Because it is hard. It is not easy. And we'll kind of explain that as we get into the broad gate later. This gate to eternal life with Jesus is hard. Part C of this, why this gate is narrow is because it's personal. It's personal. Like I was saying, I picture it as this narrow path where you're just heading up between two mountains and it's so narrow, it's so compact that only one person can get through this path at a time. And why do I say that? I say that because faith in Jesus is a personal thing. It is personal. And that's why this gate is narrow. Now mothers and fathers in here, I don't want, mothers, I don't want you to think... What I'm about to say means that you're not important because it's not true. Families, I don't want you to think what I'm about to say means you're not important because it's not true. But you don't come to know Jesus. You don't get to heaven on the coattails of your mother's faith. You don't get to heaven by the coattails of your father's faith. You don't get to heaven. This road is not a road where you enter holding hands. This road is a road you enter by yourself. It is a road you enter by yourself. Now it doesn't mean... It doesn't mean we don't celebrate godly mothers because you can influence someone into following that road right behind you. They don't enter because you're following. They don't enter because you've entered. They don't get to a free pass because their mom or their dad believed in Jesus Christ or was a pastor or, or anything like that. I meet so many people. I meet so many people. Oh, you're a pastor. Yeah, awesome, man. That's so cool. I had a great uncle. He was a pastor. You know, he preached for like 30 years. He's a good guy. 
really looked up to him. That mean, that's meaningless. Unless you believe in Jesus, that is meaningless to you and your faith. Now that person influenced them, and I pray they put their faith and trust because of the influence that they had on him. But faith in Jesus is a personal thing. It's do you believe in your heart and have you repented of sin? You see, the way is hard because you've got to repent. We'll talk about that in just a minute as well. Look what Matthew 10 says. I don't want you to, don't hate on me. Don't shoot the messenger for this scripture right here. Matthew 10, 34 through 39. It's one of the hardest scriptures to preach on as I'm just going to say it. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Oh, just not typical Mother's Day scripture. But the point is this. People don't get to heaven on the coattails of their mothers or their fathers faith. They don't get there because of their faith. See, the great thing is though, this scripture for Christians should never happen. This scripture for godly mothers and godly fathers, it should never happen. I'm not saying it doesn't, but it should never happen. Why? Because a godly mother loves Jesus more than she loves her kids. A godly mother loves her kids because of the love she has for Jesus. A godly mother loves her kids less than she loves God. Otherwise, the kids become idols. See, a godly mother will love her kids with the love of Jesus Christ, discipline her kids with the discipline and the justice of God. And be just. And I know we have many godly mothers in here. And I, I say this scripture should be encouraging for you. Because it won't happen for you. It won't happen. If your kids try to do something for the Lord, you won't turn against them. It won't bring sword. It won't bring disunity. When your kids come to know the Lord, you're celebrating with them. When your kids go to Ethiopia like Hannah Wagner, you're celebrating with them. It doesn't bring division. It brings unity of the faith. If we have a godly mother and a godly father. I, wanna, I, I think this is encouraging for those mothers in here who are leading their kids. Who are influencing their kids. To say, we won't have division in our house if our kids come to know Jesus. We won't have division. We will have rejoicing and celebrating and we will have unity. See, it doesn't happen like that all the time. Some parents, even godly parents, hate some of the things their kids do for the Lord. It's true. It happens. John MacArthur says it this way. I love what he says. If you don't listen to John MacArthur, he's a, good pa he's a good pastor. I like what he says a lot of times. John MacArthur says it this way. The narrow road to heaven is like a turnstile. Because the only one person enters at a time. The kingdom of heaven increases one soul at a time. That is true. That is why the gate is narrow. You've all been to Reds games. You can only enter that turnstile one person at a time. Heaven is like that. Enters one soul at a time. One person at a time. The gate to eternal life is narrow. But for those mothers who are leading their children, this is encouraging because the many are going this way and your children are on the narrow road. You know your kids know the Lord? Rejoice. Because a lot are going down a different road. Amen? So the narrow road. There's only one way. That's why it's narrow. Jesus. The narrow road is narrow because 
The narrow road is hard. The narrow road is narrow because it's personal. Only one person at a time. Let's look at the wide gate, the wide road. I picture this, like I said at the beginning, I picture this as a six-lane highway in Atlanta. I've been through there many times and there's many cars going through there. Seems like you always hit traffic in Atlanta, don't you? If anybody's ever been through, every time I'm there, it's like I'm on this interstate with six lanes for an hour and a half. What is going on? There's so many lanes, but yet so many people. That's what I picture it. This gate is wide because it is easy. This gate is wide because it is easy. This gate is wide because it plays to human nature. Every one of us, as human beings, we want to be good. Anybody in here competitive? Right? Oh, yeah, I know. I'm the, so competitive, I'll cheat my grandma at checkers. I will. So my dad and them always say, you'll cheat your grandma at checkers to win. Because I, I want to be the best. God. But the narrow or the wide gate says, you can make it on your own. You can be the best. The Bible says, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you're way more evil than you think. You're never going to be good enough. It's not an easy message. All it says, all the wide gate says is work hard and do, just do you. Just be you. Just do what you do. You don't need anyone else. All you have to do is just be good enough. That's why this gate is wide because every human being wants to make it on their own. They want to be the one to go from this place to this place. They want to be the one who achieves it. Christianity is not that way. Jesus achieved it for you. This gate is easy because it plays to your human nature. We all want to try to make it on our own. We all want to be God. What was Adam and Eve? They wanted to be like God. Why was Satan thrown from heaven? Because he wanted to be God. This way it lets you be God. It lets you do what you do. Gate is easy. Because plays on human nature. Part B of this is, it requires no change. This gate, this is why so many people don't want to be Christians. This is why so many people don't want to come to know Jesus. Because they would have to change something in their life. See, the narrow way is hard because it requires you to change. Requires it says you're going to change. I'm going to change you from the inside out. And most people, this gate is wide because they say, this gate is wide because they say, I don't care about your sin. Don't worry about it. You can do whatever you want to do. There's no such thing as sin. There's no such thing as a God who gives you laws and you've got to follow them. There's no such thing as that. That's what this gate says. This gate says, you can do what you want. Just be good. Just, just do what you want. You don't have to change some things in your life. It's okay. It requires no change in your human nature. It requires no humility. It requires no humility. Look at Matthew chapter 10 again. Look what it says at the end. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life, look at this. What he's saying. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses it for my sake will find it. He's saying you've got to humble yourself. You got to get to the point in your life where you say, I can't do it. And I need you to change me. I need to repent. The gospel requires repentance. Amen? Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Repentance has to happen. Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount. I don't have this scripture up on the screen, but if you want to flip uh, back to Matthew chapter 5, look what he says. In verse, Matthew 5, verse 4, he says this, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's not necessarily talking about the mourning of a death of a loved one, which may, you can use it in that context. What Jesus is talking about is blessed are those who mourn and cry and have tears for their sin because they've offended God. Whoever mourns. 
they will be comforted. Amen? This big gate, big broad gate requires no change. It says it's okay to live in a lifestyle of sin. It's okay to do these things. It's not a big deal. The Bible says it is a big deal. The Bible says you need to change. The Bible says you don't do the change. Jesus changes you. You start to shed sin. You start to put on the new things of Christ. Amen? It requires... This is probably the number one reason why people don't become Christians. And maybe we do a wrong thing when we come up and we say, just come up here and believe in Jesus. And we don't ever say, have you really repented of your sin? Do you really hate your sin and want to come know Jesus because of your sin? Is that bad? And you hate it that much? So Peter says, repent. I've said this many times. Repentance means I'm walking this way in a lifestyle of sin and I come to a place where I hate it so much that I turn and I run away from that sin. It's a 180 life. I was living in sin and I ran away from it. The big broad gate requires no change. It says just be who you are. Just do what you do. Now, I'm not saying that us as Christians should, should go to people and say, you have to quit this sin in order to be a Christian. That's not what I'm saying. Because God takes us initially just as we are, amen? He takes us. He doesn't care about your past sin. He cares about your heart, whether you hate the past sin or not. He doesn't care about the past sins. He cares about where your heart is. Are you mourning your sin? Are you sorry for your sin? If your heart is at that place, you're ready to meet Jesus Christ and be baptized into Him. Amen? Because in order to be baptized, we always ask the same questions. Do you believe that you are a sinner? And that you need Jesus? Amen? Those are key questions. Part C of this, why is this gate so wide? I think this is so true. A lot of people are enter entering it. You may say, well, that's obvious. The gate's wide because a lot of people are entering it. Yeah. But the truth is, when a lot of people are doing something, other people follow. When a lot of people are walking down this wide gate, I believe a lot of other people are following them. Because the majority says it's right. And we follow the majority sometimes. Follow the majority. The majority of the United States now is saying homosexuality is okay. And Christians are even coming on board and saying, yeah. It's not. It's the wide gate. Now, we don't go up to someone who is gay and say, you've you got to change immediately to come to know Christ. We welcome them into the church. We love them because Jesus loves sinners too. But he also said, eventually, he said to them, go and sin no more. And he told them the truth about their sin. Amen? The world says, yeah, you're, it's good. And a lot of people, when they see that in the world, they follow it. A lot of churches do that. They think the world is doing it and a lot of people are coming and we want more people to come to know Jesus so we're going to start conforming to the world. No, you stand on the Bible's teaching. The narrow way. A lot of people are entering the wide gate and a lot of other people are following that big crowd. And that is one reason why the gate is so wide. I want to tell you today, mothers, if your kids know Jesus, you have done your job in showing them the narrow path. A lot of people are going down a different path. Celebrate that your kids are on the narrow road. Think about that for a second. The majority are going this way and your kid is living their life for Jesus this way. It means you've done something. You've influenced them. But if you're on this wide road and you think, I'm going to get to to heaven because my parents are, are Christians. That's why. This gate is narrow and the only way to enter it is one after another with personal faith in Jesus.